Welcome to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, a look at the latest news in Louisiana agriculture. Coming up, we'll have a look at this week's Louisiana Ag News headlines. We'll check out the latest happenings at the state capitol and in Washington, D.C. in our grassroots government segment. We'll hear from one of you as we take you to the fields and pastures of the Bayou State and find out the latest in crop and cattle conditions. And we'll look inside the markets with commentary from experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. All of this and more coming up on this week's podcast. Now, here's the host of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, Kerry Martin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 27 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. I'm your host, Kerry Martin. We've got a great podcast lined up for you today with a lot of news items in the news headline segment. We'll talk about the increase in funding for the Restore Louisiana program that farmers can take advantage of. We'll talk about the increase in sugarcane acreage in Louisiana. And Don Molino has a couple of great stories, one on a new insect control product that we have coming out for this year. And he'll talk with Craig Brown of the National Cotton Council. In the Grassroots Government segment, we visit with Joe Mapes. He's a lobbyist for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. He'll talk about the upcoming session and this election year that we are now right in the middle of. In the field this week, we go up to DeSoto Parish to talk with cattleman Joey Register. We'll see how his cattle herd is handling this very wet and sometimes cold, sometimes warm winter that we're in right now. We'll visit with our regular market analysts, Greg Fox and Dave Foster, to get their insight on the markets, and then we'll wrap it up with a look at the Louisiana Ag Calendar. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to pass along a quick note to all of you. Of course, I've mentioned before the different ways that you can access this podcast. We've had four ways in the past. Apple Podcasts, for those of you who use an iPhone. We're on Google Play, for those of you with an Android phone. You can also find us on SoundCloud, which is a fairly popular option option for a lot of listeners and you can just go to our website and listen to it right there streaming from our website at voiceoflaag.com We've added four new ways to access the podcast. Spotify is a very popular music streaming service nowadays, and we're now available on Spotify. So just search for Louisiana Agriculture, and you can find us right there on your Spotify app or on the Spotify website. We're also available on the TuneIn Radio app. I use that app a lot to listen to radio stations around the country. If you download the TuneIn Radio app and search for Louisiana Agriculture, you'll find our podcast right there as well. There are two other ways to access the podcast. I'll be honest with you, these are two streaming services that I had not heard of, but apparently they're pretty popular with podcast listeners. One is called Stitcher. The other is called Blueberry. I know you can download the Stitcher app and you can access Blueberry through the Internet. So if you use either one of those podcast listening services, you can find us there as well. So now we're available in eight different places on the Internet. So hopefully that makes it easy to find us each time we release a new episode of the podcast. Well, let's get this one started. This is Episode 27 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast, and it kicks off right now. Here's a look at the latest news headlines in Louisiana agriculture on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. The Restore Louisiana Task Force has reallocated $10 million in recovery funds to the Louisiana Farm Recovery Grant Program. Louisiana Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry, Mike Strain. Initially, after the great floods of 2016, we'd asked for $40 million. Those were the uninsured losses. We got 10. And so now this is a second 10, which is a doubling of the amount of money available. Strain says 970 Louisiana farmers will qualify for a second payment. What's important to note of that 970, more than 600 are soybean farmers. Those 600 soybean farmers, in addition to be flooded in 2016, have just went through the great soybean crisis of 18, both due to bad weather. And again, so that will help them to be able to plant 
and stay in business this year. Strain says farmers shouldn't have to wait too long to get the extra payment. And for us, we should be able to get that money out really quickly because we already have the template. We know basically it's going to be probably the same payment they got last time, so we're really excited about that. Trade issues have caused a lot of headaches for Louisiana farmers over the last year. Washington journalist Jim Wiesmeyer spoke at the recent American Sugarcane League meeting in Baton Rouge. He told farmers there has been severe damage done to American agriculture. While the Trump tariff payments have helped, they don't heal all those wounds. We're down 70 percent in working capital from the peak in 2012. Wiesmeyer says the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill definitely helps to strengthen the safety net for agriculture, especially for corn and soybean farmers. We have really better safety nets uh, now. You have a substantial uh, revenue assurance uh, program, uh, you know, that protects from a price relationship, which means February prices are going to be very key uh, because that'll set the guarantees. Washington Ag journalist Jim Wiesmeyer. Sugarcane acreage in Louisiana is on the rise. I caught up with LSU Ag Center sugarcane specialist Dr. Kenneth Gravois recently to find out how the 2018 sugarcane crop came out and to see how much acreage will be increasing here in 2019. Well, acreage is on the increase. So the 2018 crop was about 19,000 acres larger than the 2017 crop. So we were dealing with a lot more acreage. We were dry during the summer in spots and wet down south. So going into the crop, our pre-crop estimate had us around 14,800,000 tons of sugarcane to process. Well, we ended up with 16,800,000. So it turned out to be a really bumper crop. That's the most cane we've ever processed in Louisiana, and that's the most sugar that we've ever produced, 1.8 million tons of sugar. So slightly more than last year's record crop. So the most tons that we've ever produced in Louisiana. Well, let's look forward to the 2019 crop. It sounds like we're going to see increased acreage in this crop this year. Yeah, so that acreage increase, that trend is going to continue. We don't know how much, but based on the plantings from this past year, we've talked to a lot of folks who are going to be pretty new to the industry and folks who have gotten in the last two or three years are continuing to expand. So we expect another big acreage. Now, I know that some folks really weren't able to get everything planted that they wanted to get planted because of the wet weather that we had. How much of that do you think we had in the state? How much acreage would be lost to that? Well, primarily the unplanted acres were in Assumption, Lafouche, Terrebonne, a little bit in St. Mary Parish. Um, Those acres didn't get planted and won't be planted. So people will have a large planting in those areas this year. But there's the option to keep a little bit older stubble out there. Right now, 51% of last year's acreage was in L01-299. It's an excellent stubbling crop. People can keep a few more acres in that variety. So we don't expect the, uh, the effect of that to be large. It's going to be costly to replant some of those acres. But... Um, you know, we just we, we run into that situation every now and again, and we'll just plan our way out of it. Louisiana sugarcane specialist, Dr. Kenneth Gravois. Louisiana farmers have a new and rather unique weapon to fight soybean loopers and corn earworms this season. Don Molino explains. LSU Ag Center Extension Service entomologist, Dr. C. Brown. Essentially what it is is a, a new product that utilizes nuclear polyhedrosis virus that essentially is sprayed like a conventional insecticide that infects uh, corn earworm or soybean loopers, depending on what you're after, and it'll actually infect them with virus, and the worms essentially melt, and as they melt, it spreads the virus across the field. And so it's a very uh, unique, very IPM-friendly insecticide. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's got, I think, a lot of uh, possibilities for us in Louisiana, especially with our climate, because we're very hot and very humid, and that's what it takes for to spread, you know, epizootics of virus across the field. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be uh, very good. It's going to work very well for us in Louisiana. Is it available now? Uh, so the corn airworm virus uh, is available now. The soybean looper virus is not going to be available until June of 2019, June to July. So uh, you can get the corn airworm virus for soybeans called Heligen now. And then the 
virus for soybean loopers called Certivo Soy will should should be available June or July of 2019. You've been working on this a while. Uh, so we've been looking at this product for a couple of years now, and so it's been uh, it's been you know we've worked with the company very closely and uh, you know helping them kind of you know figure out how it's going to work in the field. Is it a fit for our growers in Louisiana and really in the mid south? And it, it looks like it's going to be a, a good fit for us because. Why I like it as an entomologist, it's very IPM friendly, it's very insect specific, and so it's, it's very, very safe. It's very safe to non-target organisms because it's insect specific, and uh, it works, you know, works very well and then preserves your beneficial insects in the field as well. Who makes it? Uh, the product is made by Ag Bitech. Uh, it's a company that was in Australia but now has an American branch. They have a warehouse in Fort Worth, and so we've been working with a company as the Mid-South Group for the past couple of years. And it only affects these particular worms? It only affects these very specific, uh, very specific subset of insects. Um, it's going to be only our target pest insects that we're going after. It's not going to affect birds. It's not going to affect humans. It affects no other insects except the ones that it's targeted towards because it's a, a species-specific virus just like any other virus that's species-specific in nature. LSU Ag Center Extension Service entomologist, Dr. C. Brown. I'm Don Molino on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. The Northeast Louisiana Agribusiness Council held its annual Agribusiness Awards Luncheon and Northeast Louisiana Ag Expo recently. Avery Davidson was there. Governor John Bell Edwards was the guest speaker at the North Louisiana Agribusiness Council Luncheon in West Monroe recently. The governor thanked the Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry, Dr. Mike Strain, and the delegation for their efforts on behalf of farmers and ranchers and foresters. In Louisiana, $11 billion in economic value. That is huge for a state our size. That's huge for any state. Uh, and so it, it's critically important that we continue to support uh, all the people engaged in, in agriculture in, in Louisiana. Uh, and make sure that we do things that, that help them to prosper because when they prosper, we all do better. Uh, and so that's what the message is about here today, thanking them for their contributions to our state, uh, making sure they know that, that uh, I'm going to be a reliable partner with them, working with Commissioner Strain and their legislative delegation who, who are all here today so that we can do things that make sense. And, you know, it's not just a business. It's a way of life. Edwards, who grew up on a dairy farm in Amy, Louisiana, said he has a great working relationship with the lawmakers who live in the row crop dominated part of the Bayou State. Also at the Agribusiness Luncheon, Senator Francis Thompson received the Distinguished Service Award. Louisiana Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry Dr. Mike Strain presented Thompson with the award. The Delhi Senator has served as a state legislator since 1975. He's always been a champion for agriculture because he knows how important it is to our state. I am so happy and pleased. Uh, it's plenty of people that have done so much more than I have, but I'm glad that um, I have, it gives me an indication that I have been focusing in the right direction. Also at the luncheon, Robert Barry Barham of Morehouse Parish was named Outstanding Agriculture Producer of the Year. Charles Holly of Morehouse Parish earned the Specialty Producer Award, and Craig Smith of Doyleen earned the Young Agriculture Producer Award. For more than 35 years, the North Louisiana Agribusiness Council has hosted the Ag Expo in Northeast Louisiana. Jeff Landry is the president of the organization. He says between the big tractors, the livestock show, Ag Alley, and the businesses filling the exhibit hall, the Ag Expo has something for everyone. The Ag Expo is, is very important to North Louisiana as it relates to agriculture. The Ag Expo is all about agriculture, of course, and it's about educating the public on, on the uh, importance of agriculture here in North Louisiana, but it's also for the farmers. The farmers can connect with vendors who supply various products, um, and then it also gives families an opportunity to get out and actually even get their hands on agriculture, to experience agriculture. It's kind of like bringing agriculture, the farm, to the city so that the people can, can actually learn to appreciate where their food comes from. Jeff Landry of Landry Vineyards in West Monroe. The Louisiana Agriculture Hall of Distinction has named its 2019 inductees. They include Linda Zonbreaker of Gaydon, the late Jack Hamilton of Lake Providence, George LaCour of Morganza, and Grady Coburn of Cheneyville. They will be honored at the 6th Annual Hall of Distinction Banquet on March 7th at the LaBerge Casino Hotel in Baton Rouge. 
The Louisiana Agriculture Hall of Distinction recognizes those who have significantly contributed to the state's agriculture community in farming, ranching, forestry, aquaculture, education, and agribusiness. It's presented by the Louisiana Radio Network in cooperation with the LSU Ag Center, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry, and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Monsanto serves as the title sponsor, and First South Farm Credit is the presenting sponsor. There have been two grain bin accidents in Louisiana recently. In one of those, rescue workers were able to save the person trapped in the bin. However, in the other one, they were not. That's why the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation is holding more grain bin safety workshops around the state this spring. Louisiana Farm Bureau Safety Director Wendell Miley. We've had a few fatalities in Louisiana over the last several years and uh, did have a, uh, a flowing grain entrapment up in the northern part of the state where there was a rescue. So that's what we're trying to get to is teach our local volunteer firefighters, the guys that are first on the scene, how to safely, effectively remove someone from a grain bin uh, accident. Farm Bureau is holding three grain bin safety workshops. The first is February 26th in Iota, then February 27th in Ville Platte, and February 28th in Vidalia. If you'd like more information on those workshops, go to Farm Bureau's website at lafarmbureau.org. The new farm bill is now the law of the land, and at least one commodity group is pleased with the final version. Don Molino reports. According to Craig Brown, Vice President of Producer Affairs for the National Cotton Council, the council likes the new farm bill. And I think what what growers are going to find and I think be, be pleased with is the basic components of the new farm bill for cotton continue the provisions that were in, a, in place that growers just got through signing up for, in fact, for the 2018 crop under the previous farm bill. And, of course, the basic components are that are an ARC PLC program for cotton, uh, for seed cotton, uh, which is a relatively new term uh, for cotton producers. Uh, we maintain the marketing loan that we use in the same formula, although we were able to add a 2% cup on any reduction in the loan formula. So that's, that's a positive. Basically, I think the best thing about the new farm bill for cotton is that it continues what we believe is a very good program that started with the 2018 crop. Brown says the new farm bill has no changes in the actively engaged provisions, an important step. That was a provision that was excluded in conference that was contained in the Senate bill proposed by Senator Grassley. It would have been a very onerous provision that would have really damaged just about every farm family plan out there. So the fact that what was not included was almost as important as what was included, actually. There were some improvements that we saw. There's a provision in the current farm bill that, that uh, provides an, an exception to a more onerous uh, actively engaged rule for that limits the number of managers that a farm plan can have if you're a, a family operation. Uh, we were able to recommend and, and Congress added an exception to the lineal provision that also included uh, first cousins, nieces, and nephews. Brown also points out most of the cotton priorities were met in the new farm bill. Most of them were already contained in the House version. There were some things in the Senate version that we didn't particularly care for. But in the end, in addition to uh, maintaining the seed cotton uh, reference price at 36.7 cents and getting that 2% cup in the loan formula, we were also able to get a loan rate increase for ELS cotton up to 95 cents. The ELS competitiveness program was continued. The textile payment, the EAAP program was fully funded for 10 years, and that, that was important to us. The other aspect of the farm bill that were maintained, which we recommended, dealt in the areas of payment limits and program eligibility. None of the payment limits or our AGI means test limits were changed. They maintained 125000 for program crops, except peanuts has its own separate limit. There is a provision in the new farm bill that allow growers to once again update their payment yields. There was a provision in the in the cotton program for 2018 that allowed cotton producers to update their yields like other producers in the 14 farm bill. But there's also another provision in the in the new farm bill that allows growers to look at their payment yields for 2013 through 2017 for cotton if their current payment yield is less than 81 percent of that average then the grower can update his payment yield for cotton lint in this case uh, to be added to the seed cotton payment yields that's a very good provision 
I think cotton growers are going to be very pleased with the bill. It's, they're going to find it very similar to the bill they just got through signing up for. We're very pleased with the outcome. I'm Don Molino on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Always good to hear from Craig Brown at the National Cotton Council. If you don't know Craig, he's a Louisiana boy. He grew up in Hathaway, went to school at McNeese, and spent several years on staff in the Commodity Department of the Louisiana Foreign Bureau Federation. Up next, it's time for Grassroots Government. We'll visit with Joe Mapes, lobbyist for the Louisiana Foreign Bureau Federation. He gives us a peek at the upcoming session and the upcoming election cycle this year in Louisiana. That's next on Grassroots Government, right here on The Voice of Louisiana Agriculture Podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Farm Bureau has been working for Louisiana's farmers and ranchers since 1922, and that work continues today. If you're a farmer or rancher, Farm Bureau wants you to join and be a part of their family. Farm Bureau knows you're busy running your operation, so while you're at work on your farm or ranch, Farm Bureau is watching out for your interests. So join today. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. It's time for a look inside the halls of government in this week's edition of Grassroots Government on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. On Grassroots Government this week, we're visiting with Joe Mapes. He's a lobbyist for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Joe, we got the holidays behind us. We got a new year ahead of us, and the session is going to be right around the corner. What have you been up to getting ready for this upcoming session? Well, I'll tell you, Carrie, we've been up to the 2019 election cycle, and it applies to this coming session as well as the following four years. It's an important uh, cycle because we've got 55 new legislators out of 144 coming. And so that's what we're working on. We're traveling the state, asking uh, members to try and identify candidates, create candidates, become a candidate themselves. But we need good rural people, people that are strong in agricultural values to come to Baton Rouge and help us protect and promote agriculture. How does an election year differ from a regular year when you're trying to get through a a legislative session? Yeah, that's a great question. And we would hope that it would keep the high-profile controversial issues down, some of the social issues that come uh, when, when, you know, like Sandy says, when when we have money at the Capitol, we fight about money. When we don't, we fight about social issues. And hopefully uh, they won't bring any of those social issues in, like braiding your hair in a, in a van in the parking lot. Seriously, that was one of the issues. Uh, and, and we'll be able to, uh, the, ba- the, the budget is supposedly balanced for six, mo- uh, six years. And uh, with that 0.5 uh, renewal of that penny that we put forward. So it should be a relatively smooth session, Kerry. At least that's what we're hoping. Well, you already answered my next question, and that was going to be about budget issues. That has consumed us. For the last couple of years, I can only guess after fighting that for a couple of years, it has to be somewhat of a relief to feel like things are actually going to be a little normal going into this year. Yeah, I hate to use the word normal, uh, but we want to we want to seek a more normal uh, position. I can tell you, and I think we've got that potential in this session with, like I said, the election year and with the balance of the budget being balanced as it is for six years. Well, you and I have talked in the past about the legislature coming after agricultural tax exemptions. Uh, is this a situation now where we can maybe breathe a sigh of relief and and not see that happening since we do have a balanced budget? Well, uh, I'm not going to say yes to that. I'm, got, I'm not going to answer yes to that question because the first t- for the first time in my career representing Farm Bureau, we now are being targeted by different groups uh, for our revenue. They don't understand that if they remove our tax exemptions, it makes us non-competitive in the world market. Uh, but they've, they've, they've targeted us and they've said they're going to come after us. Not necessarily this session, but it's something to definitely start considering. Uh, we're on the radar now, Kerry. Once again, though, for those members out there listening, uh, the fact that we are going into an election cycle, uh, I reiterate again, it is very important that we go find good candidates, pro-agriculture candidates to put up because with the turnover that we have, it's more important than ever for agriculture. That's right. And it is an education uh, situation. You know, a lot of these people coming from urban areas. Uh, they don't know how food is produced and where it comes from. And it's our job to teach them, you know, not just 
uh, at the Capitol, but back home before they even get there. And that's why we're glad to see so many rural, strong rural candidates running uh, right now in some of these races. Well, we also have a governor's election as well, and I'm sure that's going to suck a lot of the oxygen out of the room over the coming year. It is, and that's, I think that's going to be a horse race. Uh, we've got three big names that have said that they're, they're, they're considering running. I mean, John Bell, of course, is an incumbent. He's going to seek re-election. Uh, Abraham has, uh, Congressman Abraham has said that he's going to run. Uh, businessman Rasponi from Baton Rouge, uh, Ascension Parish, is going to run. And uh, we're not sure how that all shakes out just yet. But pretty soon we're going to know uh, who's in the race, and, and, and it's going to be a close one regardless. Joe Mapes, lobbyist with the Louisiana Foreign Bureau. Thanks a lot, Joe. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kerry. Up next, it's time to go in the field. We'll head to northwest Louisiana to talk with Joey Register. He's a cattle producer in DeSoto Parish. Joey's coming up next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. What comes out of the ground creates energy and has been a major contributor to Louisiana's economy for over two centuries? No, it's not oil. It's sugar. Sugar cane, sweet sugar cane. Ever since the Jesuits began cultivating sugar in colonial Louisiana, this sweet crop has had a major impact on our economic well-being. Each year, our sugarcane industry creates an economic boon of nearly $3 billion for the Bayou State. This vital business engine supports fuel and fertilizer distributors, tractor and automotive dealerships, supermarkets, and more than 15,000 Louisiana jobs. The sugar industry also benefits research universities and schools, banks, and insurance agencies. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. The Louisiana sugarcane industry, helping empower the people of Louisiana for more than 220 years. Louisiana sugar, making life sweeter, naturally. We're taking you to the fields of Louisiana as we hear from one of you in the field on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. We go in the field this week to talk with Joey Register. Joey is a cattle producer from DeSoto Parish. Joey, tell folks about your operation. We're in DeSoto Parish, uh, right on the Texas line. We've got about 400 head of mama cows right now. we just got a commercial group of, of most of them are black, black baldies, back to a Hereford bulls. How many acres do you have in pasture? Oh, in pasture, probably about 1,600 acres. How many calves do you produce out of that herd every year? Well, when I said 400, we got some uh, big group of heifers coming on this year. It's, it's, it's replacement heifers, but I think we calved in about 350 calves this year so far. I know the weather has played havoc with you guys this year, very dry in the summer, then very wet in the fall. How did your hay crop come out? Were you able to get enough hay to get you through the winter? Absolutely not. We cut our first our, actually, our winter crop, we cut it in June. The first summer crop we cut in October. So we were uh, very, very shy on our hay. We actually trucked hay in out of Nebraska, some, some, some alfalfa hay to try to get us through. Planted some crops that's starting to come up, some wheat and Elbon rye to come up, and just had to really, really supplement them this year. Well, tell me about how the, uh, the winter grass is coming on. Well, with the rain and the overcast, we just hadn't had optimal weather for the winter grass. It did it did come through the ground. It is up. We're just not getting a whole lot of heavy graze, grazing on it yet. How has this weather affected your cow conditioning? Uh, are your cows in pretty good shape? Well, about half are. Where, where the hills are at, where they're able to get up out of the, the really soggy, wet ground, they're, they're not doing bad at all. Uh, some of the bottomland cows are struggling a little bit just because of the environment they're in, the uh, mud up to the knees and trying to find enough to pick and, and just, just fill their belly up. They're, they're struggling a little bit. Have you started calving yet for the spring? We, we do a fall or late fall calf crop, and, and uh, it's, it's a pretty tight. It's, it's probably less than 100 days, and we are about 95% through calving right now, maybe even more than that, and we've, uh, we've actually started working our calves already. Uh, so, yeah, mo- most of ours have hit the ground already. Well, how about the cattle market? I know it hasn't been great lately, but um, has the market treated you well over the last year? This year, I mean, it's, it's trickled down from last year, but this year, I mean, our, ours are still a tight, 
tight calf crop, like we said, and we do a direct market. We'll, we'll take two or three bids out of the field, and we ship them direct. Um, this year, we were able to round 850 what we shipped them at. We'll, we'll precondition them, wean them, precondition them, and we, we shipped them at 850. And they, they brought around $1.38, $1.34 on the two loads, so that's, that's still not bad money. Now, the killer, killer market, or horrible, I actually carried two older bulls that had issues this this week, I hadn't seen the check yet. I'm scared to go home and get it because the killer market is terrible right now. Joey Register, he's a cattle producer from DeSoto Parish. Thank you a lot, Joey. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll talk more about the cattle markets with Dave Foster, and we'll look at the grain markets with Greg Fox. That's next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. If you're a farmer or rancher, Farm Bureau wants you to join and be a part of their family. I grew up in Louisiana farm country, and I know all the hard work and sacrifice that you put into raising livestock, growing a crop, raising a family, and running a farm. Farm Bureau puts that same hard work and sacrifice into making life better for you and your family, so join today. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Now let's look at the markets with insight from the experts at the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. And to talk about the markets, we go to Greg Fox. He's a grain marketing specialist with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Well, Greg, am I correct in thinking that trade talks have dominated the grain markets here over this past week? Oh, yeah. Yesterday, uh, we saw where the rumor was that they were close to making a deal um, that China said that they would potentially spend 35 to 50 million in uh, ag products uh, if uh, a deal was done. So we're still waiting on that deal to get done. But, you know, we see those, that good news and that gives us that support we need in this market. And, uh, you know, it's something that we've kind of been beating the drum on, but it, we need to get something done on the trade side, get these markets back to somewhat of a normal trade cycle and then focus on, you know, important things as far as exports and usage and planted acres and harvested acres. Once we get the trade talks done and get that out of the way, uh, one way or the other, you know, you know, either we have no tariffs or we're going to go forward with tariffs, then I think these markets can figure it out. But, um, you know, today, kind of a flat day after the news on Thursday, of something potentially getting worked out. So just kind of a break, I think, break, taking it in, seeing how these markets are going to react when we could potentially see, uh, you know, Planet Acres numbers and those things at the end of March. And then again, President Trump did say he won't do anything on the March 1st deadline if negotiations continue to go in a positive direction. Well, Greg, USDA is holding its annual Outlook Forum in Washington, D.C. this week. Have you seen any of the crop numbers coming out of that forum and how they're affecting the market? Uh, potentially, you're looking at about 92 million acres of corn planted and about 85 million acres of soybeans. So that's pretty close to some of the earlier numbers that we, we heard thrown out there. Um, you know, 176 yield on corn and 49.5 on beans. So. You know, that's still strong numbers, even though it's less bean, um, but they're, you know, I think they're penciling in much better export numbers than what we had for the last harvest season. So I think they're factoring in that we're going to get some kind of trade deal done with China and we'll see better trade or better export numbers because of that. Greg Fox with the Louisiana Farm Bureau Marketing Association. Thanks a lot, Greg. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now we move over to talk about the cattle markets with Dave Foster, CEO of Cattle Producers of Louisiana. Dave, I know that you spent most of the day today in a meeting at the Louisiana Beef Industry Council. Of course, that organization helps to build demand and promote beef and, of course, hopefully raise the price of cattle. What went on at that meeting today, Dave? Well, there was a lot of proposals that the board had to consider. I think there was 15 different proposals that... uh, that came before the board, uh, and and there's some exciting things happening now, Kerry, with the, the new structure of the beef board since uh, 2015. Uh, 
But but one of the programs that they funded, which I thought was an excellent thing, uh, it was called the FFA Classroom Beef Posters. And, and what that is, it was a, a set of, of four uh, posters, if you will, that showed the uh, four primal of a beef carcass. So the, the loin, the chuck, the rib, and the loin. And, and each of those primals, it, it, it showed the different steaks or different cuts that came out of that particular primal. And so these young people now can look at something like that and they can take it home with them and they say, hey, uh, this, is, uh, this is where this steak is co- comes from or this is where this ground beef comes from or this is where this roast comes from. Uh, and and that, is, that to me, it, it, it is educational and they're able to say, you know, to their mom and dad that they're in the cattle business. Hey, you know, you complain about that dollar that you have to check off. Well, this is this is something that that, uh, that it's going toward. And and so the board approved uh, to 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 get those poster sets for 208 of the FFA chapters in the state of Louisiana. So I thought that was a good thing. They they also funded a. Uh, a dietitian conference, and so these these dietitians that uh, that are in these schools, they're putting together uh, the the meals that that uh, that are good and healthy for the children. Uh, they're they're having a conference in uh, in Baton Rouge, and they funded a sponsorship for that. So these are these are things that I think go a long way to uh, to appease, I guess are people that are having to pay that dollar and say, where in the world's that going? So I think we're, uh, I was very impressed with, uh, with the funding that took place today. And again, Dave, this council, the Louisiana Beef Industry Council, the job of that council is to uh, promote beef and build demand for beef l- using the state portion of that dollar beef checkoff, correct? That's correct. That is exactly right. And, and you know, for us, Kerry, the, it, it is a challenge for the board uh, to to try to fund projects, if you will, because uh, the federal government is is in control of the the Cattlemen's Beef Board, and the way the law reads, the checkoff law reads that that dollar, if you will, and we get fifty cents of that dollar, can be only used by promoting the product beef. Now, again, as you know, we are a cow-calf state, and so the commodity that we have uh, from the beef sector is that calf or that yearling. And uh, those, about 80 to 90 percent of those leave the state. Uh, they go off somewhere and get finished out in the feedlot, and then they come back in a package to the grocery store or into the restaurants. And so for the board to, uh, to figure out, uh, you know, how are they going to do this? Can they fund this project? And and be within the guidelines. It's uh, it's quite a challenge, but but we're reaching out, or they are certainly reaching out to to different uh, segments of of the industry that uses beef, and and uh, I, I think this FFA project certainly should be a a bell ringer for sure. And I think uh, one thing important to note is that that council is made up of people in the beef industry. Uh, we have members on there from four different organizations, the Cattlemen's Association here in Louisiana, uh, the Louisiana Farm Bureau, uh, the Auction Markets, as well as your organization, Cattle Producers of Louisiana. So we have actual people in the cattle business and in the cattle industry making those decisions on what to do with that checkoff money. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, Dave, I really appreciate your update on the meeting today, and we'll check in with you on the next podcast. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. What in the world is going on in Louisiana agriculture? Well, let's take a look at the calendar and find out. A look at the Louisiana Ag Calendar is next on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast.
This is Trace Atkins for the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. Louisiana farmers and ranchers dedicate their lives to producing the food we eat and the clothes we wear. Agriculture touches all of us every time we sit down at the table. So support Louisiana agriculture by joining Farm Bureau. And you don't have to be a farmer to join. If you're already a member, we thank you. Your membership supports farmers and ranchers right here in your local community. The Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation, the voice of Louisiana agriculture. Now to wrap up this week's podcast, let's take a look at what's coming up this week on the Louisiana Ag Calendar. Coming up on the Louisiana Ag Calendar, several events over the next couple of weeks to talk about. We'll start with Tuesday, February 26th. We have three events actually happening on that same day. The first one is the BASF Dicamba Stewardship Training Workshop. That will be held in Alexandria. If you're going to be using Dicamba on your operation this year, you need to attend this Stewardship Training Workshop. We had one a couple of weeks ago up in Oak Grove. This is the second and final one in Alexandria, Tuesday, February 26th. Also on the 26th, it's the LSU Crops and Cattle Forum being held in Alexandria. For more information, check out the LSU Ag Center's website at lsuagcenter.com. Another event happening on the 26th, the Louisiana Cotton and Grain Association is holding their annual meeting in Monroe. And then the final event happening on February 26th is the first of three grain bin safety and rescue training workshops being sponsored by the Louisiana Farm Bureau. The first one is on Tuesday, the 26th in Iota. The second one is the next day, February 27th. That's in Ville Platte. Then on Thursday, the 28th, the third grain bin safety and rescue training workshop will be held in Vidalia. If you'd like more information on those workshops, you can check out the Farm Bureau's website at lafarmbureau.org. On February the 27th, the LSU Ag Center is holding a citrus meeting in New Orleans. Again, check out their website for information on that. Then coming up in March, on March 7th through the 9th, it's the Back to Your Roots series sponsored by Campty Field of Dreams. That will be held on the Louisiana Tech campus in Ruston. Well, that is a look at a few of the upcoming events on the Louisiana Ag Calendar, and that wraps up Episode 27 of the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Be sure to connect with us on social media. We're on both Facebook and Twitter. The handle is at Voice of LA Ag. We'll see you next time right here on the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. Thanks for listening to the Voice of Louisiana Agriculture podcast. This podcast is produced by Kerry Martin and the Louisiana Farm Bureau Federation. For more information, be sure to check out our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org and lafarmbureau.org.